Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another one of my Gaudi Mitzbez 22 YouTube videos and Podbean podcasts. If you're watching this, instead of listening on Podbean, you can see that I've shaved off my beard. <laughs> and so I, I often say that my beard has a platonic exitus raditus schema going, wherein I, I, I just grow it out until it's intolerable, and then I shave it all the way back. So, you know, that's that's the nature of my beard. Right now, I currently look like something of a, a reptile or a bug or something, because I have no hair on my head whatsoever. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. My guest today, if you're watching, you can see Dr. Rodney Hauser. Dr. Hauser's, at least for now, chair of the Department of Theology and Philosophy at DeSales University, my former colleague, my buddy, and uh, also my former institution of employment. Uh, I'm sure you are looking forward to not being department chair again someday. But anyway, uh, Dr. Hauser is, in fact, uh, a theological scholar of the thinking of the theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar. It's, in fact, how we first met. It was at a Balthasar conference I was sponsoring at DeSales. It's what led to his getting hiring at DeSales, and the rest is history. Uh, he's published extensively on Hans Urs von Balthasar. I uh, just had a recent issue uh, article in, what was your last article? I haven't read it, I have to admit, in Comunio, International Catholic Review. What was your article? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Uh, God's, Univer God's Universal Salvific Will and the Mission of Comunio. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We need to talk about that in the future. That sounds interesting. Uh, and so maybe we'll unpack that in the future. But today's topic, a uh, very, very important one. It was actually Rodney who suggested it to me the other day, and I jumped on board immediately. And, and the topic is sort of rooted in the uh, theology and thinking of William Cavanaugh, but among others as well, which is the nature of religion in modern political liberalism. Uh, we all just sort of take it for granted that we know what religion is, that it's this uh, discrete, reified, objective entity where, you know, it involves rituals and belief in God. It's utterly privatized and so on. Uh, and, and yet what we don't seem to understand is that this view of religion is essentially a modern construct uh, and is not without its problems. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rodney Hauser immediately here to set up the problematic for us. Uh, why did let's start? Why did you you said you've been reading a lot and studying a lot in this? Issue. I should say too that Rodney does teach courses at DeSales on sort of politics and religion, as did I, and he is very conversant in the literature. Uh, so often seen in, in publications like New Polity, Front Porch Republic, uh, the ideas of people like D.C. Schindler, Mike Hanby, Patrick Deneen, not that he necessarily agrees with Deneen in all aspects, but anyway, so I'm just trying to establish your bona fides to, to speak on this topic. So go ahead, Ron. What, what, what set up the problematic for us in the conversation here today? Yeah, I mean, I can just start on a kind of a, a autobiographical note. I, I'm sort of working on a book, uh, and I don't know if I'll ever finish it or anybody will want to publish it, but <laughs> I, I, I want to write a, a sort of introduction to Catholicism uh, for people living in a secular age. Um, and, and, I, and it seems to me that that every single great theology that's ever been written in a church, in the church, in the history of the church, has been written in response to a particularly pressing problem at the time. Uh, you know, that we, we Catholics take history very seriously. And uh you can't read Augustine's City of God without knowing what what's he what's he responding what's going on in the Roman Empire, you know, and uh, yeah. and you and you can't read the I mean the very first question of the Summa is is Thomas weighing in on a debate in the Middle Ages about whether we need revealed religion because Aristotle knew everything, you know, I mean, you know, so so <laughs> you know, so yeah, he, yeah, he's already yeah. weighing in on a very pressing question that wouldn't have been a pressing question for Augustine. So I th it seems to me that today the pressing question is how to be a Catholic in a secular liberal age. And uh, and so in order to kind of write this book, I, I, my plan is to kind of unpack the creed and show how the creed responds to various problems of secularism. But I realized that I couldn't even really do that before I got to the problem of how liberalism and how secularism view religion. And that's what got me reading. And you've read all, you know, a lot of these people too. We've talked about, you know, yeah, Cavett's yeah. brilliant book, uh, The Myth of Religious Violence, and you've had him as a guest. Um, yeah. But other, so just one thing I'll do just real quickly for the sake of our readers, because you had just, uh, watchers, uh, I, you had just mentioned this before we came on, we were speaking informally. These are just some people that I think are worth reading on, on the question. Uh, and uh, most recently, there's a really interesting book by a guy named Brent 
Nongbri of Indian descent. Uh, and uh, he's, his, his book is called- You want to spell, spell that last name for us? N-O-N-G-B-R-I, Nongbri. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he's, as far as I know, he's actually a Christian. I think his father was Indian. His mom might have been a Western, and he now lives in and and writes in the in the West. Um, but his book is called "Before Religion: Poland: the, A History of a Modern Concept." And uh, and 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 William Cavanaugh has a brilliant review of it in First Thing. So that's a good way to if you want to get. Oh really yeah! All right, good. Up to and we'll t- I can say a couple of things about that book later. I haven't even read it. I've just read what Cavanaugh says, but I can tell I can say a couple of things about that. I, I intend to read it though. It's it looks like a, a really good book. Uh, but the other you know usual suspects here. I mean, way back in 1962, uh, Wilfred Cantwell Smith uh, wrote a book called The Meaning and End of Religion where he's really one of the pioneers in showing that the word religion as used in the modern West is a total Western construct born in the modern era. It has nothing to do with the way the word was used by Aquinas or Augustine, for instance, or very little to do with it. And what's interesting, going back to the Nongbri book, he asked his father what the Indian word, not not Indian word in generic, but the particular dialect uh, that his father spoke, what word in that language corresponded to the word religion? And his father said, there, there isn't one. <laughs> There's no, <laughs> as far as he knew in any yeah. of the Indian languages that, that did it. So that kind of gives you an idea. And just, uh, he mentions this fact, but I, it's always astounding for me to think about this. It was in the 19th century that Western missionaries went to India and told Indians that they were practicing a religion called Hinduism. That's right. They got blank stares. You know, we are right. And (laughs) and the Indians so misunderstood the concept of religion that when they did a census at one point, they included Muslims and Buddhists as Hindus. They didn't know how to divide. They didn't know how to divide the, the religions as neatly as we Western people do, right? So, so right. these are some of the problems that these great books by uh, Kavanaugh, Paul Griffiths. Peter Harrison is another one who has a book called The Territories of Science and, Re- and, and Religion, which is a, a, a also a kind of a masterpiece. And his thing is science had to, needed this category religion in order to define itself as being totally objective and universal while religion is private yeah. and subjective, you know, that kind of, yeah. so he did yeah. a lot of that sort of stuff, right? So, so that's all just like kind of things to help our, our viewers get a little bit of a leg up. There's, a, there's been a, a long sustained effort on the part of people like William Kavanaugh to make the rest of us aware of the fact that we use this word sometimes and we think it's just, it's like, it's like a, you know, it's just like, well, that's exactly what religion is. And it's, and it's a, and it is a Western construct, as you said earlier. But the thing that got me thinking about the topic, so this is, we'll, we'll get our conversation kicked off this way. This would be a kind of fun way. I was on my way home from school a few weeks ago, uh, maybe several weeks ago now, and I was listening to NPR, which I sometimes do just to get my blood pressure up, you know, which is, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and Terry Gross was interviewing a young Muslim woman who had just written a book called Hijab Butch Blues. Um, and uh, it's it's a young Muslim woman, you know, struggling with her sexuality and, and kind of all these things. And, uh, you know, I, I listened to about five to 10 minutes of the interview. And then I just got so annoyed at sort of the condescending NPR thing that was going on there that I had to just turn it off. But when I got home, I actually did some research about the book. And what's amazing is if you just do a, a Google search on hijab, butch, blues, you'll you'll get a list of uh, euphoric uh, reviews by the entire Western world, how brave this girl is and all this stuff. What's kind of interesting about it, though, and what's uh, what's I think complicated is this young lady was was born in the Middle East, and then her parents moved to a, a very a wealthy part of the Middle East that was much more Westernized, um, and she experienced herself as having uh, same sex attraction, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is 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 interesting and 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 worth thinking about. But what's interesting is when she actually sat down to write her this memoir about her experience as a Muslim woman, uh, young lady, she, she discovered, you know, she, she discovered this in her teens. Um, the categories that she interprets her experience in are entirely Western categories. I read now 
rather uh, significant excerpts from the book. I mean, the very fact that the title hijab butch blues, I mean, butch is not a word that you're going to find in, you know, uh, traditional right. Islamic text. You're not going to find it in the Quran, you know, uh, or the imams, the writings of yeah. the great imams yeah. or whatever. It's a, it's a totally Western way of understanding uh, of this experience. Um, the, uh, the fact that this young lady now uses preferred pronoun they uh, instead of she uh, is a totally uh, Western thing. It, it might be right. It might be wrong. It, it's, but it's thoroughly Western, right? Yeah. And what's what, what really bothered me about this is how NPR is incapable of seeing this. They're incapable of seeing that what they're doing is they're celebrating the fact that a young Muslim woman can only think of her experience in purely Western categories and celebrating the fact that she now thinks of her experience in thoroughly Western categories that stand in pretty serious odds with majority Islamic views on these things, right? And, right. and I was thinking as I walked in the house, I was, you know, I was in a bit of my typical bit of a rage. I was like, why didn't they just call the episode the only good Muslim is a Westernized Muslim? Because that's yeah. the that's what I got from, from the piece. But of course, th this is precisely the issue. The West has been defining the way people should think for so long that we don't even realize that we're imposing a Western schema on, on the rest of the world. And, and the word religion is a perfect example of this. Us going to India in the 19th century and saying, hey, y'all are Hindus, you know, <laughs> and <Hindus laughs> yeah. a religion, you know, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And so that's just, I, that's just my way of kind of setting up the problem. But those are just my initial Initial yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it points to the fact, you know, for example, you know, it's also true that when you look at the the general mainstream media in the in, in the West, the only good Catholics, acceptable Catholics are the liberal secularized Catholics. Right. And, and the implication yeah. is, is that uh, this religion thing that is Catholicism is obviously moribund and backward and benighted and unenlightened. And so we're not going to accord the same sort of respect to Catholics who still think in those categories. Right. We're only going to lionize and hold up as laudatory those Catholics who think like, in a sense, secularized Westerners. Uh, and, and so, yeah, absolutely, whether you're talking Hindus or Muslims or, or, or Catholics or, or, or whatever, uh, you've you've got this phenomena of Western toxicity, and central to this central to this agenda has got to be this sort of essentializing of uh, of the definition of religion. Yes. Okay, so what what would you say is the essential definition of religion that we get in the West, and what would be problematic about that definition? Yeah, no, this is that's that million dollar question, right? So uh, it, it seems to me that it begins with especially Locke's letter on toleration. Uh, so that's yes. why I've been, I've been doing some reading uh, to, to try to write this first chapter of this non-existent book. <laughs> that may never <laughs> exist. <laughs> right. Oh, but, uh, I know the syndrome quite well. <laughs> yeah, one of the millions I've written in yeah. my mind, you know. Um, but uh, but in what's interesting about what Locke is is trying to do in the letter on toleration, of course, is he's trying to deal with this new problem in, in in the 1600s in Europe, where you now have a variety of expressions of Christianity, and uh, you have these new nation states that are arising. And Kavanaugh's brilliant on this. Uh, and you have these, quote, wars of religion. Now, it's Hobbes and Locke that told us, by the way, that they're wars of religion. And that's precisely part of the myth that Kavanaugh yeah, yeah. has tried to, to, to correct. It's, it's, that's a, one, a totally one-sided reading of what was going on here. But the point, to go back to the question of religion, what's interesting about what Locke does there, it's very subtle. If you read that letter, you, you really have to watch what's going on. He actually needs religion to be a certain kind of thing in order for it to work for liberalism. And what he needs it to be is primarily an individual choice, a matter of private choice. And he needs the church, therefore, to be a voluntary association. There's no doubt about him needing a religion to be first and foremost a matter of private choice, private conscience. And he understands conscience to be a private matter, by the way, which is something you talked to, uh, you know, what's his face about? Matt Levering. Matt Levering, yes, exactly. Yeah. I was getting him Matt Levergood, who's no longer with us uh, and confused in my mind. But uh, so, um, so yes, so he needs it to be a, a matter of purely private conscience, but he also needs the church, therefore, to be a voluntary association. 
And because he needs it to be these things, he knows that Catholicism is an awkward problem. Uh, in, in the earliest draft of a letter on toleration, in fact, he said that Catholics cannot be tolerated in liberal states, which is a really interesting insight, which I think Locke might be right about. I don't think we can be yeah. trusted <laughs> in liberal states. Yeah. But there's one further point about this is if you think about Catholicism, and this is a kind of a strange way of putting it, but I think it's I think it's fair enough. It's the most religious version of Christianity. And by religious, I mean, it has all the, all the, the, oh the, yeah, that bother it, it checks all the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got priests and altars and rituals and holy days of obligation. Yeah. And yeah. Got yeah. All that baggage. And that's precisely the stuff that our founding fathers loathed about Catholicism. They needed it to be a spiritual thing, inner, you know, a matter of conscience, not this external thing with all these bells and whistles and props. But the problem is once you do that, all traditional religions also get thrown under the bus yeah. because it's been a characteristic. If you read the works of Eliade with his comparative religion books, it's, there are like priesthood, uh, prophets, uh, authority. These are, these are trademark things that are patterns within religious history. And just one anecdote to finish this all out, um, in that book by that I was just telling you about by Nongbri, again, I have to look at his name. He said that some of the guys that some of the Europeans that went to like India actually found that they liked Buddhism better than Hinduism because it had less religious baggage and because it was more like Protestantism. So they saw Buddhism as a Protestant version of Hinduism. That was their way of, under, way of understanding it. So th yeah. those are just some things that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's so true, you know, uh, rather than, I mean, what was what was Aquinas's definition of religion? Essentially, it's simply a virtue that uh, uh, where we, in a sense, pay our due homage to to the Creator, to God. It's a sort of natural thing, and it embodies a, a set of embodied practices where that virtue is carried forward. But Aquinas would not have had this modern notion of religion as this discrete thing cordoned off from other discrete things wherein we set aside a part of our life you know for rituals and morality and spirituality and worshiping god and so forth certainly aquinas was part of his definition of religion was the worship of god uh but it, but it was never this reified thing uh it was more a sense of well this is the way we just affirm what we consider to be the most really real this is it's it's part of our definitional structure of, of what constitutes the real, what constitutes truth, what right. constitutes our existential <coughs> response to everything, rather than this compartmentalized aspect of our lives that pertains to the realm of individual piety and private conscience. Am I right? Absolutely. That's that's actually a really good little summary of Thomas's view of religion, because he 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 says that it's a um, he's got a whole question on it in the Summa under the virtue of justice, as you know, and yeah. he sees, therefore, religion as an aspect of justice, right? So, but what he says in the, in the initial piece there is really interesting, and you nailed it when you said it's, 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 a, it's an account of the real. He says, when a person looks at the universe and they see order, they conclude, almost all people, he says, conclude that there's an orderer, and religion is giving that due to that orderer. It, it's giving what is what is due to the order of the universe. Well, worship, <laughs> because they yeah, we have everything yeah. because of that thing now. So in, and so for Thomas, it's a universally human phenomenon, almost universally. He does say almost all men, you know, when they see this thing conclude. Yeah. Order, which then, as you put it so well, finds expression in various bodily ritual, et cetera, nor normative things. So for Thomas, and this is, I think, also true for Augustine, and this will get us to another part of the modern definition that's problematic, all religion is on its way to being Catholicism, because Catholicism is the revealed way to worship right. God. It teaches right. how to worship God properly. So when a Thomas looks at Islam, he doesn't think, oh, here's another religion. He sees Islam as simply faulty Catholicism. It's Catholicism that's heretical on various le levels. And if right. you think about it, that's exactly how an, a Muslim would have to think of Judaism and Christianity, right? They would think of us as being quasi-tritheists or maybe even tritheists. 
uh, and Jews as having the story wrong about Abraham, you know, right? So all religions, in fact, look at other religions as just kind of um, inferior versions of themselves. I think Buddhists probably look at Hindus this way, right? I, I, yeah. right? But yeah. for the liberal, what they're going to try to do is not do that. They're going to try to look at religion strictly in terms of these species within a genus. But the problem with that is it doesn't work. <laughs> these these yeah. are not species yeah. and genuses. The, the, there is no genus of religion um, and, unless it's an invention of the modern mind, which it can be and it can be helpful as long as we know it's an invention of the mind. Like we can use the word. And, and but we have to understand that it's not a part. It's really a mental construct that we're using for convenience sake. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the etymology of the word religion, I know it's a, it's somewhat in dispute, but the sand, standard one seems to be, you know, it comes from re, legio, legio being the same root word we get ligament from, that, that which sort of binds things together. Yeah. And so re, religio is, is, the, are, is our response to the really real, our response to what it is we consider to be most constitutive of existence. And and therefore to affirm that this is what binds everything together and it binds us to one another, binds us to, to the whole. So it refers just in general to the realm of what we constitute as real and therefore as binding on us. Therefore, <coughs> that calls into question the notion, therefore, that religion is about essentially uh, uh, gods, supernatural things, things that go bump in the night, paranormal, occulty sort of things, Ouija boards, Eucharist, same thing, same nonsense. Um, but that it really is not really binding. It's just a set of pious feelings. You can consider it binding if you so choose, but it isn't really an expression of that which is binding uh, it, it, and therefore can be trivialized and dismissed. And it seems to me that the reason why modern liberalism can treat all religions equally or allegedly, but they can't is that they treat all religions as equally trivial. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's equally unimportant as equally not really dealing with the realm of the binding, the normative, the constitutive. And therein I think is the essence of what you and I are sort of driving at here today. It's yeah. not that liberalism gets religion completely wrong. There is a thing called religion, but that their construal of it as this utterly privatized thing in the realm of the new, and private is 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 not really what religion is no it's all understood over and against this other thing that they invented called the secular yes and, that's, and that's so right so now already in order to understand religion is what is <clears throat> what is not secular you've already done something to religion to change its fundamental nature and of course, you've also changed secular in its fundamental, because secular also has a, a medieval meaning that has nothing to do with not having to do with God, right? So, so that's exactly what's happened. And that's what Peter Harrison does beautifully in his book, The Territories of Science and Religion. He shows you that religion is, is always paired off against these things in modernity, science and, and the state and, you know, all these different yeah. things. Yeah. And, and as you said it, if, if in fact religion is a response to the real, if it's a response to the order of the universe and, and, the, and the order is found in the universe, then it can't be something cardened off and dealt, dealing with only things that go bump in the night, as you said, right? Yeah. Um, funny, what, what Locke says in the letter on toleration is, and he, you know, he's talking about Catholics, he doesn't say at the moment, but he, he talks about religions that confuse the matters of heaven and earth. Right. Yeah. He says we yes. must keep absolutely separate the things of heaven and earth. And I was yeah. thinking of the Lord's prayer that I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus would make a very bad Lockean, you know, that yeah. Yeah. Be, oh, yeah. Be, the things of heaven with earth. Yeah. And the new heavens and the new earth and so on of the book of yeah, Revelation yeah. or, you know, that the kingdom of God is already here. And, yes. uh, you know, it's so anti-gospel, this notion of a great divide between the earth and heaven. Uh, yes. one, one wonders what the heck Locke was really thinking. Uh, but but to, to go back to you know to your con your your very accurate statement there therefore the secular is also a modern construct right uh, notice too though 
that what comes to be identified as the secular is something, as you pointed out, over and against religion. And the secular is therefore identified as that which is universalizable, whereas religion and revelation are not. The secular is something universalizable because it's rooted in objectivity, reason, science, empirical realities, logical realities. Therefore, in the modern secular world, it is the secular which gets privileged over right. religion, both Absolutely. politically and otherwise. And my point then is leading up to this, and then you can comment, you know, David C. Schindler in his great book, The Politics of the Real, and we discussed this with him yeah. on this YouTube channel, makes the very, very uh, important point that, yes, liberalism, liberalism does grant uh, a great deal of what we would call religious freedom, but it is on liberalism's terms. Yeah. It's on secularism's terms. Notice that the government in a liberal mm -hmm. regime in extending religious freedom to religions uh, and, and it, it, the, the, the limiting principle of what government can or cannot do to religion is a self-limiting principle on the part of government itself. In other words, religion is not considered to be this natural reality that has its own natural authority that is, that is a priori before the state, is pre-state, and therefore has an authority actually over the state, is an utterly foreign concept yeah. In, in the modern secular world, because it's secularity that then sets the boundaries and therefore ultimately is hegemonic and totalitarian yes. because what secular the secular can gives, it can also take away. Absolutely. No, that's 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 well put. So think about I mean, so just I think, again, the thing that struck me about the NPR interview of this young lady it doesn't surprise me, of course, that NPR would be thrilled that there's a young Muslim girl who's claiming to be gay and, and claiming to be Butch yeah. and, and all that stuff. What's utterly astounding is that it would never ever cross NPR's mind that their way of thinking about this is also sectarian, that, that they're coming yes. from- Yes, yes. It, the, 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 the thing that's most maddening about liberalism as a religion, which is kind of what it is, uh, as a Christian heresy or whatever, is its absolute inability to look at itself critically and to say, wait a second, maybe we also have a narrow perspective on these matters. And the reason they don't think it is, is for people of that ilk, there's only one scientific way of thinking about gender and sex. And in other words, uh, the way the modern world in the West, the modern West, I'm gonna say the modern West, because that's really important, thinks about gender and sex to people of the NPR mindset is that this is just factual. This is just, that we're just talking about it scientifically. Yes, so exactly. Psychologically, you know, psychologically. And religions can only think of these things in various superstitious, historically time-bound ways. So obviously the majority Muslim community is thinking wrongly about these things. And this girl has just discovered the truth. She's not thinking like a Western. She's just exactly. And this goes to that often quoted statement that you, you, you uh, from you, uh, 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 from Alistair McIntyre, you know, that liberalism is the only meta narrative that has convinced the world that it's not a meta narrative. Uh, but uh, but this is part of this is absolutely necessary in liberalism's uh narrative and self-narrative, whereas it views the rise of modernity with through the lens of the myth of original violence, namely that, that there was this violence created by this thing called religion yeah. that William Kavanaugh dis destroys, that these yeah. were wars of religion. Uh, but yeah. anyway, the wars of religion then have necessitated then the, the, the counter mythology of the narrative of peace that the Enlightenment brings and secularity brings right. against this original violence that religion brings into the fore. So it's absolutely critical to liberalism's project for it to present itself as this neutral field, as something that is beyond all meta narratives because it is rooted in pure objectivity, which of course is abject, risible nonsense. Uh, as you pointed out, it's clearly a form of sectarianism in its own right. So in other words, the proper way to view this would be to view Western liberal, secular liberalism as a, as a meta narrative, and therefore as a kind of uh, constitutive response to what is the really real, and therefore a kind of religious response to existence. And that therefore in this Muslim girl that you're pointing to, what we have here is not a, a, a Muslim girl who is criticizing, in a sense, certain aspects of her own religion. We have a young girl who is a kind of syncretistic amalgam of certain aspects of Islamic religion and certain aspects of secular religiosity. And yes. to recognize that that's what's going on here. Yes. We have we have competing worldviews, essentially. Yes. 
uh, yeah. and, and not religion versus secular or yeah. good versus it's just we have competing constitutive responses to reality. Exactly. And so and so exactly what liberalism has to do to pretend that it's not a meta narrative is it has to radically circumscribe the area that religion can exercise its domain. So, and that keeps getting smaller and smaller, of course. So it's no longer appropriate, according to National Public Radio, for a religion to tell you what to do with your genitals. Yeah. Right? I mean, I remember Hauerwas's old thing, he used to always say, yeah. any religion that doesn't tell you what to do with your pots and pans and your genitals ain't worth being called a religion. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I love that quote, right? But that's, yeah. but that's precisely what NPR is saying. By the way, your impersonation of Hauerwas is really awful. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I can't do the Texas. Thing. I can't do him either. I can't do him either. I, I grew up close to the Mason-Dixon line, but not that. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. Uh, yeah, but the, but the, so the thing is, they're, 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 of course, you know, all of the reviews I've been reading of this book by this young lady are saying that she's a that not only does this book a great a manifesto for you know sexual freedom and blah 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 it's also a wonderful exposition of Islam, right? Yeah. So in other words, she's getting Islam right because she's not allowing it to tell her what to do with her you know her 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 her, her sexuality. Right. 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 But this is precisely it. There's never been a religion, a, a real religion, on the face of the earth that hasn't weighed in on these matters in definitive ways. I mean, you, you, uh, oh, yeah. whether we're talking Hinduism, uh, Islam, Judaism, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, what then the, I think it, these people have to do, the, the, those who embrace liberalism have to then point to the handful of people who have actually become liberals within these religions and say, no, but this, this imam that I met said that it's okay to, you know, change. There you go. Yeah. yeah. You know, our our father, James Martin Catholicism, you know, like I just had an article, national Catholic register came out a few days ago where I was severely critiquing uh, James Martin's outreach website. I I don't want to get too good down this rabbit hole, but it's, it's exactly the same point. Which is if when you read the outreach webpage, what comes across is if you're a Catholic who thinks in traditional Catholic categories on the issue of the sexual morality of homosexual action, sex acts, if you think that way, well, you're not really being a very good Catholic because you're not inclusive. You're still yeah. being exclusive and right. you're still being a hater and a bigot and a prejudicial person. You're not paying attention to the Jesus of total inclusion and so on. Yeah. So what the, what they ignore is that what they're engaging in is a complete revision of Catholicism yeah. in light of this other religion, <laughs> this other yeah. religion called modern secular liberalism. Uh, yes. And it is another religion. Yeah, so so that takes us, I think, to another interesting issue. You're, you're, I'm glad you brought up the Martin thing because that's that's a classic uh, point, a, a, a kind of classic case in point. I think one of the better ways, at least, of getting people to think about religion in the older way, in the more traditional way that Augustine and Aquinas used the word, is to think about how language works with human beings, right? So. Um, it's not that we begin autonomous individuals who can't speak and then we choose a language, <laughs> right? And, yeah, then, yeah, and, then, yeah. and then we go, oh, yeah. I'm going to choose to speak. That It's that we're, we come into a, a culture and we come into a family that already speaks a language. They're not doing anything evil by, quote, imposing that language on us. They're inviting us into um, hu- our humanity. The right. world of linguistics, which is yeah, essential world, to who we are. Yeah. Which, 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 how, how would it be if a parent, or two parents decided to be utterly mute around their children unless yeah. they impose a language on them? Seriously, right? And I wouldn't be surprised that we get to this point at some point. But it, it, <laughs> what's really interesting is um, what that does is that liberates a child to be able to think about the world because we can't think non-linguistically. That's not the kind of creatures we are. Maybe God can, but we can. Yeah. We're linguistic yeah. beings, right? So when Heidegger says being language is the house of being, he's saying something very, very profound. Um, so so why, what does that have to do with religion? Well, similarly, when you're talking about the real, when you're trying to figure out what where the order of the universe comes from, you need a framework within to think that. And religion provides that framework. Now, the analogy breaks down a little bit because there can be better and worse religions, but languages are all sort of serviceable for the most part, although there are probably better languages than others for, you know, Greek might be better than English for, for talking about love, for instance, or something like that. But, 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 yeah. but it would be that 
religion is something that helps you think about the big questions. It's not something that you choose after you've already thought about them. And so what liberalism does is it lapses into this thing that thinking that liberalism has this universal language, just, just thinks about things without a mediating tradition, but that's nonsense. That's why I said at the very beginning yeah, of this, yeah, this, yeah. this uh, podcast that this young lady who wrote this book, Hijab Butch Blues, is totally thinking of her experience in the categories of the modern West. She's using our language and our yeah, way. yeah, and that's affected the way she thinks about it. Yeah, and 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 therefore to to switch gears a little bit, and I, I want to warn my viewers here and, yeah. and you. Uh, while we were talking earlier, I got a, a text message from this my contractor who's coming oh. over to replace me that he's on his way. So unfortunately, we're going to have to cut this short in like ten minutes, and then that's what we're going to do, Rodney, is we're going to do a part two. Uh, where where we can just go on at more length, but yeah. let but uh, so so today's episode will only be like fifty minutes, and we can go on a little bit longer after that. Uh, but anyway, what does this then say about the debate that's raging right now in certain Catholic circles about integralism? All right, mm -hmm. and of course, integralism is perceived as this horrific, yeah. awful Constantinian restorationist union of throne and altar, inquisitions, mm -hmm. repressions, banned books, da 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 all yeah. that stuff. Whereas in point of fact, from where I sit, and then you can comment on this, all governments are constitutively integral with some, some vision, some fundamental worldview of what constitutes the really real. Therefore, all governments are essentially theological yes. uh, insofar as they're inherently metaphysical, whether they want to admit it, because the, to not to take a stand on metaphysics is, in fact, a stand on metaphysics. Yes. Uh, it's to make a metaphysical claim of some kind or another. So it would seem to me, therefore, that so much of what constitutes this debate about integralism is already played out on the on the playing field of secular liberal notions of yes. what constitutes church and state and union. So uh, that's not to say that I'm in I'm arguing here in favor of a strong union of throne and altar. I'm not. What I'm pointing to is the sheer ambiguity of this very debate because it exists within the confines of these flawed categories. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, so if you think about it, Thomas sees religion as a natural virtue because it's a natural response that a rational being makes in the face of the mystery of reality, right? So, so religion isn't a choice, first and foremost. It's constitutive of our being to be religious. We have to... <clears throat> We have to think of our lives in terms of what the ultimate meaning of life is. Okay. So liberalism is a way of, of, of speaking about the ultimate meaning of things and their value. They have certain values that they think are ultimate freedom, equality, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. These are the things they talk yeah. about. They, they don't yeah. like to talk about much authority, truth, you know, goodness, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Um, as a result, what we have and always have had in America is an established religion that is be that began as a kind of Protestant thing that has become increasingly less Protestant and more secular, but it's all movement along the same trajectories. It went from a kind of notion of the equality between denominations yep. to which then evolved into a more amorphous sort of pan Protestant yep. vision of religion as a, in other words, the toleration of all various Protestant denominations is equal before the government yep. actually then has a theological effect on mm -hmm. the Protestant yeah. denominations who then begin to simply morph into one another as right. this is a homogenized thing called pan Protestantism, yes. which then is only gets challenged with the wave of Catholic immigration. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted no, you. No, that's thank you. No, that's super helpful. If you think about the unintended reformation, um, that book, uh, Brad Gregory, Brad yeah, Gregory. Exactly. I mean, he makes a really important point there that helps to ex explain America because Gregory's claim is that there are already really problematic things in the thought of Luther, which are going to move in this direction unintended because Luther would never intend to create a secularized world. Obviously that was not his thing. Yeah. But yeah. They're already there. He's already privileging in some sense, the, the primacy of conscience, private conscience. Um, he wants a less structured church. Holy orders is not a sacrament. You know, he divides things that are distinguished in the middle ages, et cetera, et cetera, which liberalism is just going to, take that to an extreme it's just liberalism just is hyper protestantism which is why if you think about it that you almost cannot distinguish at all 
what's going on in mainline Protestantism from what's going on in national public radio. They've literally become absolutely indistinguishable. And I'm not speaking hyperbolically. I'm saying yeah. that what we're going to hear from the pulpit in a mainline Protestant church, um, in, especially in the in, in, in New York area, California area, you know, et cetera, is going to be indistinguishable from the values of national public radio. And and you say, well, why is that the case? Well, the case is it was already heading in the direction of what liberalism has just taken it to its logical conclusion. Um, yes. And if that's the case, chap, then what you're arguing about integralism is interesting because it seems to me that if we're naturally religious, Thomas is going to say that means we're kind of naturally Catholic because Catholicism is the end of religion. Yeah, it's yeah. Myth and, become uh, fact. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So that a, a kind of quote Catholic state would not be a problem unless it weren't something that emerged from beneath also. And I think that's where that's yeah. what separates DC Schindler from, say, some of the other forms of integralism out there that are like the, the Adrian Vermeule and that needs the church to come down and bit yeah. slap into shape. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, you can say that on my show. Okay, good. Yeah. 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 That, that's kind of integralism, I, I think, is problematic. And I know you do too. Yeah. I would be much more interested in something that kind of, you know, emerges up from the people and then is also reinforced by good kings, good president, you know, whatever, what good government. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, that is then the ultimate expression of some sort of democratic impulse. Uh, call it a paleoconservative impulse that ultimately politics is downstream of culture. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and therefore it's very, very important to reform the culture mm -hmm. if we want to have any kind of a governmental political expression that yeah. reflects Christian values. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be simply an imposition from above. Yep. Over and and then then that's that's what you see now. Um, to, to but to go back to the the sort of you know the the unintended reformation. I, I interviewed Timothy Flanders, who's a traditionalist. Uh, mm. The other day, his new book, City of God versus City of Men. And he made, he made an, a very similar point to what you're making, which is that ultimately the problem with modernity is that it's Protestantism on steroids. And essentially what happens is that the Protestant revolution failed. It simply mm -hmm. failed. I mean, mm -hmm. the Protestant vision, if we could just get rid of all the, the hierarchical ecclesial yeah. apparatus, and then yeah. we can have this kind of coming together of Protestant culture, Protestant religion, Protestant state, we can create a sort of Protestant kingdom. And yet all of the various divides, bifurcations that Protestant theology contained within it yeah. led to simply liberalism and yeah. therefore the defeat of, of this Protestant revolution. Right. Um, so, and then this is America. I mean, Chesterton yeah. described the United States, right, as a nation with the soul of a church. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is one of the best descriptions of America. Imagine, well, I mean, you, you go through this pan-Protestant phase, then you get the wave after wave of Catholic immigrants. It's interesting. It's not until really about the 1850s or 60s that you see the American Supreme Court adopting the language of a radical separation of church and state. Yes. But th there's a reason why our constitutional amendment, First Amendment, does not use the language of separation. That's right. Jeffersonian. language. It uses the language of disestablishment. Right. And, and that has a different emphasis than yeah. separation. Right. And our founding fathers did not want a radical French version, separation, anti-clerical. They wanted something else. But the something else enters into the American bloodstream when Catholicism enters in large numbers. Then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, the Protestant majority starts talking in terms of, whoa, 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 we need to separate church yeah. and state. And by church, they meant Catholicism, yeah. they, they, you know, um, and so anyway, I, I'm, I'm really going on, on a tangent here, but the history of this yeah. sort of thing to come back where we started called religion in the American mindset in particular, it cannot be viewed absent this history, uh, this right. constitutional, political, cultural history of a gradual movement from the hegemony of some kind of Protestantism to a radical secularization as a result of immigration from Hindus, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Catholics, and so, and yeah. so now you get this witch's brew that is that is modern sort of pluralism, so called today. 
But anyway, right. we're sort of running out of time. I do apologize. Yeah, no, I, no, no worries. I, I, I did a lot of grading to do. <laughs> and my contractor was not supposed to be here for another half an hour. And he's going to my dogs are going to be barking very, very seconds. soon. Yeah. So I do assure my viewers and you, we will have part two, that would be uh, fun. part two to this. And we'll schedule it at a time when uh, there will be no interruptions. It, but anyway, why don't we still have some time? Why don't you do you have any last words, any kind of way you want to maybe summarize where we where we're headed with all this? Yeah, I'll just pick up on your last comment, because I think that's already on the way to summarizing everything we're talking about. And that is that um, the radical privatization of religion, which is already a part of our founding, is what makes possible the radical secularization, even yeah. if the founding fathers didn't intend it they didn't see what radical privatization of religion is going to lead to. And, and we're now, we can see it. This is why like even a guy as good as John Courtney Murray could, could be kind of duped by the American experiment because everybody in America was still broadly Christian when he was, when he was doing right. this, thing, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so it was easy to read, you know, the thing this way, smarter people had more foresight. and could see and people that lived other parts of the world that had seen radical secularization already. If you think about it, the United States is always just 20 years behind Europe on all these things, you know, whatever. <laughs> yes. does, yeah. Right. So yeah, we're just like Europe. And it's not people. to be forgotten that Jefferson was a Francophile. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Yeah. So, so it, it is the case that our founding fathers were much more deeply religious and all that stuff, but they still understood religion in this very truncated Protestant way. And that then gives a lot of room to the state to, to, to do what it wants to do without the interference of religion. And then that's what leads to, you know, National Public Radio just thinking that their way of thinking is just the way that all right-minded people think. That, that's, yeah. In, that's, oh, you know, yeah. 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 And, any and, any, just, and any, anything you know, else is disinformation. Exactly. <laughs> and, the, and the best thing that all the religions can do then is gradually start thinking like NPR. That's, the, that's well, what, you know, and what this could set up for our next conversation as yeah. well, which is, not only are these things actually religions in their own right, they yes. actually then have their own sacraments, their own dogmas, Absolutely. their their own inquisition. What is woke culture if not simply the inquisition, the imposition of a set of dogmas? What is the deplatforming from social media of so-called yeah. disinformation, which yeah. really isn't disinformation always, but quite often simply different information that goes against the dogma, the reigning. Look at all the covid claims that were being made by people say on facebook that were deplatformed from facebook because they said things like masks don't work the vaccine's dangerous yeah. covid is not that big a deal and then it turns out all of those things were true uh, but they they ran afoul well i don't know covid not being dangerous is true but you know you get my point yeah. right uh that they ran afoul of a certain set of dogmatic yeah. concepts and ideas about public safety and the role of the government in imposing public safety and and the role of information dissemination which is now must be controlled by a holy index of forbidden books <laughs> yeah if i could just one final yeah. thing along yeah. that line that that, that that this brings to mind to get to 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 affirm your notion that we now have a kind of an orthodoxy that's being um, yeah. I'm, I've been reading this book for for a while because I keep reading it in snippets, but it's actually really good. It's James Cone's book on Martin Luther King Jr. and Ma and Malcolm X. It's a fantastic book. It's it's I've very read it. Well. Yeah. Oh, you've read it's, it. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. I love that book. It's so good. Yeah. But what strikes me about the book is how diverse uh, the understanding of how blacks in America ought to to work do this thing. How how do we how how should blacks uh, what do they hope for in America? And, and what Martin Luther King Jr. hoped for and what Malcolm X hoped for were in pretty serious tension with each other. Although eventually down the road, they're going to have their reconciliation in Harlem and, and things like that. But there were still, and there were possibilities. And, and Cone does a beautiful job in the book of outlining the various ways in which Blacks thought, how is this going to look in the future? What do we want it to look like? If you think about it now, Larry, when you go to any of these instructions in, um, you know, uh, racial sensitivity training and things like this, there's literally one way that you're allowed to think about race relations. It literally has a vocabulary. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's words that you have to learn that you've never heard before. There's yeah. things that you have to affirm. Um, if you say, for instance, that we should strive for a colorblind society, you're a racist. Um, yeah. and, and that makes Martin Luther King Jr. problematic. You, you, so that's just a case in point where we 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 take something that um 
has now literally become a, a dogmatism that's actually more yes. narrow than, than Catholic dogmatics in a sense. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If you for, take, for example, the great Harlem Renaissance that took place in the, in the 20th century, yeah. which I consider to be not just one of the greatest flourishings of, of intellectual and cultural and artistic life among African-Americans, among blacks, but among all groups in the United States, period. It was a tremendously yes. Yeah. innovative and creative explosion of creativity and intellect that came out of the Harlem Renaissance. And yet, according yeah. to the modern standards of racial indoctrination, yeah. most of what came out of the Harlem Renaissance would simply be considered the imbibing of the ideology of their oppressors and yeah. falling into a false consciousness of what we just need to achieve within this white culture, yeah. you know, uh, our, our, carve out our own little niche. They, they would have been condemned. Yes. You know, and, and yeah. so you know, one of the greatest flourishings in the history of the United States, period, of all races, would have simply been dismissed. But anyway, that's simply my take. I know that yeah. you love the Harlem Renaissance as much as I do. No, yeah. And I love this uh, uh, Black writer, um, Albert Murray, um, who, who wrote a really important book called The Omni-Americans. And, and again, that book today, if, yeah. if, if you suggested that in a book on a, in a race studies course, it would be it would be anathema. It would be banned because, he, he, you know, he, his way of thinking about race relations is not the same way that, uh, you know, some others think. And which that's fine, too. But but why are we only allowed to think of it now one way? Which it proves that yeah, we have. Exactly. Kind of, uh, and not to beat a dead horse, but to go back to the Harlem Renaissance, one of the things that made it such a genius and creative impulse was precisely because it arose out of the experience of, 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 of racial oppression, of yeah. suffering. Yeah, uh, yeah, many yeah. of these people were the grandchildren of full on slaves. Absolutely. Okay. And, and, and it was precisely that experience of suffering overcome that, yeah. that gave that Harlem Renaissance its explosive power and force. I'm not so certain we could do the same thing anymore. But anyway, we should probably wrap this up. Yep. Uh, once again, I apologize. My contractor, my dogs are going to be barking soon. We will have a part two. But thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Stay tuned for part two of this conversation, which will come very soon. Thank you very much.